says, The faithful watchman, or just another wind of doctrine, the faithful watchman, or just another wind of doctrine. Let's kneel before our Maker as we open our, the Word to study. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning not worthy of the calling, not worthy to be admitted to those heavenly courts above, and yet, because of your great sacrifice, we do have that chance, that opportunity. We desire today that you will help us, that we may be able to serve our Lord and Savior. We praise you and thank you. We pray that we may, as we read, have understanding, that we may see the truth as it is in Jesus. Amen. Let's open our Bibles this morning to Isaiah chapter 21. I want to open to Isaiah chapter 21. And we're going to go to, to verse 11. Isaiah 21 and starting at verse 11. It says, The burden of Duma... He calleth to me out of Seir. Now watch closely. Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? Verse 12, the watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. Watchman, are you doing your job? There are many today who profess to be watchmen on the walls of Zion. The question is, are they a watchman? Or are they, are they just another wind of doctrine? For we know that there will be many winds of doctrines blowing. And that there will be more winds of doctrines, meaning that there will be more error than there will be truth that will be being presented in this last hour of Earth's history. Let's go to our Bibles again and to Ezekiel. And we want to go to Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3, and we're going to start at verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 17. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Wherefore, hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way. To save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness which he hath done shall, be, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand." Nevertheless, uh, 
If thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. Also, thou hast delivered thy soul. So I ask the question, those who are the watchmen, what is the message that they are giving? Those who are professing to present a message of truth and righteousness, a message of warning, the storm is coming. That is true. But what is the storm? Do they have their events in order? Are they presenting the truth as it is in Jesus? What is their focus point? What are they really teaching? What is the end result of the path? For you see, there are only two paths that are cast up. The broad path and the narrow path. Now, of course, all would think that they are on that narrow path. The question is, which path are we really on? Going back to our Bibles, let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah and chapter 56. And we're going to start at verse 10. Isaiah chapter 56 and verse 10. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. So what do we do when a shepherd who is blind as a dumb dog, a w claiming to be a watchman, giving a warning, and yet they themselves may not realize that the warning that they are giving is not truth. Self-deception is probably the most common deception out there, where we are deceived of ourselves. They are all ignorant, it tells us. So how do we know if a watchman is true and faithful, or if they are a false shepherd? There's only one way. There is only one simple way that we may know, and that is the Word of God. This is the sure test. You can't judge it by what I say. You can't judge it by what another says. There are so many that listen to one sermon and say, wow, that was so good. And they listen to another, wow, that was so good. And they listen to another and wow, oh, it was just marvelous. And yet none of the three agree. Not even in the slightest details. Was it good? Was it truth? Maybe one of them or part of one of them, maybe none of them. We would not be making those foolish kind of mistakes if we were ourselves digging into the word of truth. The Bible says, study to show yourselves approved. It doesn't say to study to show your neighbor approved. It doesn't say study to show the another person in the church or in the family approved. It says study to show yourself approved. If you study the word of God, 
and you live out that word of God in your life, then others will see that in you and you won't have to be saying, oh, well, I'm very knowledgeable about the scriptures. There won't be any self-aggrandizement. We will simply be able to form a true and right opinion of the Word of God. Let's go now back to Ezekiel, except this time we're going to go to chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33. And we want to start there in verse 6, Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 6. And it says there, But if the watchmen see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But if his blood but, excuse me, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and warn them from me. So the watchman if they are a true and faithful watchman, will hear the word from the Lord, from the scriptures, and that word they will use to give warning to those who are in danger. Come out. Your house is on fire. Awaken. Now is not the time to be sleeping. Sudden destruction is coming. Mm -hmm. I have set a watchman unto the house of Israel, the church. Will they awake? Will the majority awake? No. Will a few? Yes. A few will awaken. We'll look at that in a moment. A few there will be that will heed the warning. I think about the storms. And I've watched numerous different video clips where there's an impending wave, a large wave maybe coming from an earthquake, a tsunami. And the people are lined up along the beach or they're on a pier or some other place. And one that I'm thinking of in particular, there was another person who was videoing who was up at a higher point looking down at the others. And you could see this wave beginning to swell. And the people are standing there with their cameras and their phones taking pictures of this huge wave as it's coming in. And suddenly the wave begins to break and they realize they're in trouble. The man up top videos the whole thing. As people are being covered by water, as they're being drugged, as cars are moving, because of the force of the power of the water. How many heeded the warning that there was a wave coming? They all went out to see the majority. And yet, there was that one who found a high place that made the video that I watched. There was one who was watching carefully and yet was wise in his actions and was not swept away. Which are we going to be? For each one of us have been given the job of watchman. Each one of us 
are to be a watchman, a warning giver. Are we going to give a true warning? How can we if we don't know the word? If we are building upon false principles, upon preconceived ideas, upon the histories and the teachings of a church instead of the teachings of the Word of God. I'm going to go over to Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 2. Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 2, it says here, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. That's simply saying, prophesy, teach, preach against those pastors in the church. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, unto the preachers. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? They're all looking for some new teaching. They're looking for something new, maybe fanciful, something that others have not thought of or preached so that they can gain in popularity so that their YouTube video will go viral. Since when was God's message ever popular? Never. When was his message ever popular? Never. I want to go now to the Spirit of Prophecy, chapter 4, or, or uh, volume 4, Spirit of Prophecy, volume 4, and page 472, page 472 of the 1884 edition of the Great Controversy. And... Page 472, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. And we're looking at this, the um, second, or first full paragraph right here in the middle. It says, This view that now appears to those who rejected truth and chosen truth chose to cherish air. No language can express the longing which the disobedient and the disloyal feel for that which they have lost forever. Eternal life. Men whom the world has worshipped for their talents and eloquence now see these things in their true light. They realize what they have forfeited by transgression, and they fall at the feet of those whose fidelity they have despised and derided, and confess that God has loved them. The people see that they have been deluded. They eagerly accuse one another of having led them to destruction. But all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers, the watchmen, I add. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Or they would choose to present a message of alarm. It's coming. Doom is coming. For years we've all heard, in the spring, it'll happen in March, in October, it happen, it'll happen in the fall. And it's coming, November, the November elections, it's sure to come this time. And yet, time goes on. False watchmen, prophesying falsehoods. 
Now, I'm not belittling or shortening the time of the Lord, for I believe without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus soon will come. I know not the day, the hour, the year, the month, the season. For that information we are not given. But if a storm, as came through here less than a week ago, and nearly came to our home here as a tornado, as it came through, if now a tornado came through and destroyed this home and destroyed us as it did to one lady in our area, her probation was closed. It doesn't matter for her that probation might be closed in the spring of this year or that it might be closed at some other point in time. Her probation closed. So if she wasn't ready last week when the storm struck her house and literally picked it up off the foundation and turned it upside down and left it intact, setting next to the foundation. If she was not ready at that point in time, she's forever lost. So these events, those who prophesy such things, are false watchmen. Jesus said, be ready. We need to be ready now. If we are waiting for the spring or the fall of next year, we may be found lost too late. We need to be ready today, this moment. If you've not fully committed your life to Christ, if you have not given Him your everything, if you've not fully dedicated it's too late to wait till tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes, for it changes its name. Therefore, today we must be ready. Let's go back to our quote here. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now, in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. Multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. False watchmen. And they turn upon the false watchmen. I'm back quoting again. And they turn upon the false watchmen, the very ones that once they excuse me, the very ones that once admired them most, will pronounce the most dreadful curse upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The sword which were to slay God's people, are now employed to destroy their enemies. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. The mark of deliverance has been set upon those that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be, be done. Now the angel of death goes forth, represented in Ezekiel's vision, by the men with the slaughtering weapons, to whom the command is given, slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary, my church, my professed church. Says the prophet, they begin at the ancient men which were before the house. That's Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 6. The work of destruction begins among those who profess to be spiritual guardians for the people. The false shepherds are the first to fall. 
Are you a false shepherd or are you a true and faithful shepherd? Are you following false shepherds or are you studying and searching the word for the truth? I want now to go to the original testimonies. Um, original testimony pamphlet number two. And this was written in 1856. 1856. And I'm going to start right here. This is page 17. You can get this publication from us. But this is not an advertisement today. We're going to read from page 17. At the conference at Battle Creek, May 27th, 1856, I, that would mean Ellen White, was shown in vision some things that concern the church generally. The glory and majesty of God was made to pass before me, said the angel. He is terrible in his majesty, yet he realize, yet ye realize it not. Terrible in his anger, yet you offend him daily. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Friends, I want to be one of those few. I want you to be one of those few that find that narrow path. The many, the majority, will find the way, but it's the wrong way. There are only two paths. Now, as I continue to read here, I want you to watch and listen closely because as I read, you're going to see that this wide path is not necessarily speaking of the world. But it's talking about the worldly way of the professed righteous. Let me continue. These roads, so the wide and the narrow, these roads I saw were distinct and separate in opposite directions. One leads to eternal life, the other to death, eternal death. I saw the distinction in these roads, also the distinction between the companies traveling these roads. The roads are opposite. One is broad and smooth the other narrow and rugged. So the parties that travel these roads are opposite in character, in life, in dress, and conversation. Those traveling in the narrow way are talking of the joy and happiness they will have at the end of the journey, of the joy Excuse me. Those traveling in the narrow way are talking of joy and happiness they will have at the end of the journey. Their countenances are often sad, yet often beam with holy, sacred joy. They do not dress like the company in the broad road, or talk like them, or act like them. A pattern has been given them, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, opened that road for them and traveled that road for himself. His followers see his footsteps and are comforted and cheered. He went through safely, so th can they, if they follow his footsteps. In the broad road, all are occupied with their persons, 
their dress, and the pleasures in the way. Hilarity and glee they fully indulge in. And think not of their journey's end, of the certain destruction at the end of the path. Every day they approach nearer their destruction. Yet they madly rush on faster and faster. Oh, how dreadful this looked to me. I saw many traveling in this broad road who had written upon them, dead to the world. The end of all things is at hand. Be also ready. Those traveling the broad road, professing to be Christians. The end of all things is hand, they say. Be also ready. And yet they are in, not the narrow way, but the broad way. They looked just like all the vain ones around them, except a shade of sadness which I noticed upon their countenances. Their conversation was just like the gay, thoughtless ones around them, but they would occasionally point to the letters on their garments with great satisfaction, calling for the others to have the same upon theirs. They were in the broad way, yet they profess to be of that number who were traveling the narrow way. Those around them would say, There is no distinction between us. We all go to the same church. We all listen to the same preacher. We all sing from the same books. We all have the same books on our shelves in our library. We all watch the same TV programs. I know, we talked about it last Saturday before church. The broad road or the narrow road? What is your choice? Skipping down just a little bit, it continues here. I saw a great lack of submission to the will of God. I was pointed back to the children of Israel after they left Egypt. God, in His mercy, called them out from the Egyptians that they might worship Him without hindrance or restraint. He wrought for them in the way by miracles. He proved them. He tried them by bringing them into straight places. And yet, it continues here to say, they lusted after the leeks and the onions. They wanted the diet of Egypt. They missed the simple, narrow way. They wanted that which was of the broad path and yet professed to be in the narrow way. They claimed to be watchmen, yet they were running the road, the smooth path. Going back to Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 348. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 348, and right at the very bottom of the page, we're going to start there and go on to page 349. Innumerable are the erroneous doctrines and fanciful ideas that are obtaining among the churches of Christendom. It is impossible to estimate the evil results of removing one of the landmarks fixed by the Word of God. Few who venture to do this stop with the rejection of a simple truth. The majority continue to set aside one after another of its principles until they become actual infidels. Until they become actual infidels. The majority those traveling the broad road. So, 
what is it that the watchmen are to watch for and to watch against, to warn against? What is it? Let's go to our Bible, 2 Timothy. We want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. In the New Testament, 2 Timothy. Second Timothy and chapter four. And we're going to look specifically starting at verse two. Second Timothy chapter four, starting at verse two. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now remember, they're in the broad road. They are listening to false watchmen and they are proud that they have written on them that they are advertising that Jesus' coming is soon. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Now, here in verse 5 it said, Endure afflictions. Did you notice earlier when we talked about the narrow road that not only is it narrow, but it was rough and it's also steep. That means that it's not going to be easy going. When you're going up a narrow, steep, rough road, it's hard work. It's not easy, it's not smooth. There's going to be trials and perplexities along this road. It won't be the smooth way, the easy way. It seems like you will run from one trial to the next. And each one will get harder, unless you're on the smooth road. Back to verse 6 here. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. His choice was to present the word, the warning. Now, if we go back to Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, and page 413, page 413 of the 1884 Great Controversy, we find here in the midst of the second paragraph, the opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are all the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one, or all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. And now I want to jump up and go back and read something on the same page near the end of the previous paragraph. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Sound familiar? We just read it, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3. And the next sentence says this, That 
time has fully come. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That time has fully come. False watchmen are everywhere giving a false warning and someday they will set a time that will be too far in the future and they will be saying when Jesus is coming in the clouds this can't be him it's not time because they have looked and time after time they have set dates and these dates have failed we know not the hour the day, the month, the year. But we know that He will soon come to receive His own who are in that narrow path, who have reached the highest end of that narrow path. I want to go now to page 196, the same book. Page 196 of the 1884 Great Controversy. And we're going to be looking at paragraph 2 of page 196. God saw that many of His professed people were not building for eternity. Many of his professed people were not building for eternity. And in his care and love, he was about to send a message of warning to arouse them from their stupor and prepare them for the coming of their Lord. The warning was not to be entrusted to the doctors of divinity or popular ministers of the gospel. Had these been faithful watchmen, diligently and prayerfully searching the scriptures, they would have known the time of night. The prophecies of Daniel and John would have revealed to them the great events about to take place. If they had faithfully followed the light already given, some star of heavenly radiance would have been sent to guide them into all truth. The warning was not to be entrusted to the popular, to the educated. Now there may be a few, there may be one here or there. We think of Paul. He was very educated. But an entire transformation came over his life. His was no longer a life as it had been. He was not the same man. So I'm not saying that one possibly here or there may have found the truth and may be able to present that truth. But what I am saying and what the word of the Lord says is that these, those will be very few, very, very few. It's going to be the simple layman that will present the message of truth. Maybe those who are yet babes themselves in the truth will be those who are presenting the message of warning. You need to be right with God. You need to do right, right now. I want now to go to Review and Herald. And we're going to go to December 29, 1896. Review and Herald. December 29... And this is 1896. It's an article titled, True Worth. 
And it says here, Satan is working diligently and most successfully to put his selfish stamp upon the characters of even the professed Christians. And many are becoming narrow in their ideas of duty and obligation. They are degenerating and receiving a stamp of character which is offensive to God. Self-love and unholy passions occupy the citadel of the soul. To those who are professedly keeping the law of God, but are daily transgressing its holy precepts, let me say, Search, O oh, search and see how little reverence you have for eternal things. How little love for devotion. The proving time has come, and angels are watching the development of character. How many, since they have professed Christ, have changed for the better? My brother, my sister, are you becoming more and more like Jesus, who is pure, holy, and undefiled? Can your associates see in you the likeness of Christ? Can they see that you maintain in your dress, in your conversation, in your daily life, the simplicity of your master? Many know so little about their Bibles that they are unsettled in the faith. They remove the old landmarks and fallacies and winds of doctrine blow them hither and thither. Science, falsely so called, is wearing away the foundation of Christian principle. And those who once were in the faith drift away from the Bible landmarks and divorce themselves from God while still claiming to be His children. While still claiming to be his children. I'm quoting here, and I'm continuing to quote, but they, but are they? No, no. The relation they sustain to God is truly represented in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. Many will say unto me, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity." Let's go to our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians and chapter 4. Always seems to evade me. We want to go to, there we go, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning, cra cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Let us be no more children tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You're not going to be deceived and carried about by all of these false watchmen if you are looking to the word of truth for your salvation. When you see these false watchmen and their videos that are sent to you, or their DVDs or CDs that are sent, 
you will take one quick look and go, oh, not truth found here. For it does not agree with this word. But if you don't know the Bible, if you don't know the word of the Lord, you will be led into deception. I want to finish with one more thought from Review and Herald. I have it written here in my Bible. It's been here for some years now. It's Review and Herald, March 1850. Review and Herald, March 1850. If we are firmly fixed upon the present truth and have our hope like an anchor of the soul cast within the second veil, the various winds of false doctrine and error cannot move us. We will not be moved by the many winds of doctrines that are blowing. The false watchmen we will not be led astray by. I ask today that you will consider the many, many out there, the majority who as you look not only at their lives, as you look at their teachings and see that they are following the broad road, yet professing to walk in the narrow way, that you will not be blown about by every wind of doctrine, but that you will stand firmly upon the platform that you will be found within the second veil by faith with Jesus there keeping his law because this is love that we keep or that we obey his commandments. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, sinners in need of a Savior. Please, as we repent our evil ways, whether they be listening to false watchmen, whether they be doing our own way, whether it be self-worship, whether it be in dress or diet or music or any of the many millions of traps that the devil has set for our feet, may we not be found doing the will of the evil one, professing to be on the narrow road, but on the smooth highway to hell. May we be found on that narrow path, cast high up above. Forgive us where we have failed. We pray for strength to be overcomers, for we cannot do it on our own. We have not the strength or the abilities. May our faith not fail in this last hour of Earth's history as we see much closing up about us. But we also know that you will continue to have the four winds of strife held until your servants are sealed. And you cannot seal your servants until they are fully committed to you. That nothing else is more important in their lives. We thank you, Father, for the Sabbath day. That we may rest, that we may spend time in the Word. That we may draw close to our Lord and Savior. We thank you 
that you are leading and guiding a people in that narrow path. May we keep our eyes focused on our Lord and Savior who is just before us, that we not stumble and fall. Direct us and seal us, each one, as we commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.